Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of the, the second day of Asia Grid. Uh, the first talk is two two DSA small and secure data signatures with cup based development key pairs by just uh, just used Lunes. Lunes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll present. Perspective is not ideal. 
Um, so these rely on different algorithms to uh, do scalar multiplication. So um, the, the, maybe the best example is you have curve 2 pi f 19 for diffie Hellman and you add ed 2 pi f 19 for your ed DSA algorithm. Um, these have different uh, doubling routines, different addition routines, so you have to implement all of these, which adds some complexity to your scheme. Um, also, uh, as a second maybe downside, maybe a small one, uh, is that the, uh, the format of these public keys is actually distinct. So for the Hellman, you'd have an X coordinate, and for your uh, signature scheme, you'd have an X coordinate plus a sign bit. So you need to encode a full elliptic curve point somehow. Um, so this second point was actually uh, solved, which is quite straightforward, by X at DSA. So instead of um, using a full point as your public key, you use only an X coordinate, and then you uh, somehow deterministically retrieve a, a point from that. Uh, so you just take sine bit zero always, for example. Um, so you get a point, and you use that for your signature scheme. Um, the second part um, is kind of what we try to do with, uh, with our work. So instead of having uh, a, an authentication protocol, which explicitly needs this group structure, um, we try to build a different kind of protocol, which we call QDSA, um, which inherently only uses this text-only arithmetic, or only arithmetic on the Kuma varieties, um, and therefore only needs um, uh, very few algorithms, and will end up with a very simple uh, way to do essentially the public key algorithms you need in practice. Um, so the, the main motivation for this work was actually the GNS2 case. Um, so there, if you um, work on the Jacobian, it's actually much more complex than working on uh, kind of the X-only uh, analog, which is the Coomer surface. So there, it really helps a lot to move everything to the Coomer surface and completely uh, uh, get rid of all explicit Jacobian arithmetic. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, and it's kind of sad because about two-thirds of our paper is about this GNS2 case, um, but I will focus on the elliptic case because most things are kind of analog and much easier to explain there. Okay, so a bit of a reminder on the, this Kuma arithmetic. Um, so this is the basic setup of an elliptic curve. Um, we have this nice picture over the, the real numbers. Um, so these points form a group, so they have some, some group operation, which is we write additively usually. Um, um, if we try to work these formulas out explicitly, you see maybe you end up with some divisions by zero sometimes, so you can Kind of, uh, uh, differentiate between doublings and additions, so you think of it as having two operations, so doubling and additions, um, and you can easily combine this into some kind of scalar multiplication routine, so uh, some double and add algorithm or something. Um, now, if we want to do something similar on the Kummer line, so the Kummer line would be the, the x coordinates of the points on the elliptic curve, so you can kind of project to, these, uh, to this line, and what we want to do is we want to define similar operations on this line as opposed to on the elliptic curve. Um, and the way we do this, we just abuse these pre images that we have. So, as, as long as these points are not like order two or at infinity, uh, we'll have two pre images. Um, and for, for the doubling operation, for example, we can just double these two pre images and project them to this X line. Um, and then we can define the doubling operation on the line by just sending this, this green point to the image of the doublings uh, of the pre images, uh, which is this orange point on the line here. So, we get a, a well defined doubling operation there. Um, and for addition, um, we can do something similar. So now we take two points on this line, and we want to somehow add them together. Um, we just look at the pre-images, and we take all possible uh, 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 sums of these two points. Um, and then we project all of these to the next lines. And what we end up now with is our two points. Um, and these two points are um, the x-coordinates of the sum and the difference of our two original points. Um, but we cannot really distinguish between them, so we don't know which is which. So we get kind of a pseudo addition operation where, given two points, we can get their sum and difference, but we cannot distinguish between the two. And this is um, maybe in a more familiar form. This is where the x, uh, uh, the differential additions, uh, come from. So if you're given one of the two, so you're either given the sum or the difference, you can of course compute the other one uh, by just eliminating it. Uh, uh, but it's this first operation which um, uh, which we'll, we'll use to define our our signatures here. So how do we define signatures from this? Well, the starting point is, um, well, the classic Schnorr signature. So the Schnorr signature is going to build up in a couple of steps. You start by defining a Schnorr identification scheme, um, which is like a zero knowledge, uh, interactive zero knowledge proof uh, based on a group. Then you apply via Shamir to make it non-interactive, and you include some message somewhere, and you end up with it with a signature scheme. So we just look at this first part. Um, so we try to, uh, uh, to alter this identification scheme to get rid of the group structure there and just 
that, that they can rely on, on, on a Kuma variety instead. Uh, so how does snore identification work? Quick reminder, um, so uh, it works in a group, so we have two points, a P and Q, to which both the prover and the verifier have access. Um, and the prover also knows the discrete law of Q with respect to P, so that's this uh, alpha, and in, in this protocol, the prover tries to prove knowledge of alpha without revealing anything about it. Um, so the way it works, the prover picks some scalar R, um, does a scalar <laughs> multiplication with respect to the base point, gets some, some large R, sends that over. Um, the verifier chooses some, some random challenge, C, sends that back to the prover, and then the prover takes some combination of all the scalars that he has, so R, C, and alpha, this, this is called S, and S gets sent back to the verifier. Um, and now this is the crucial bit, so now the verifier has to do this double scalar multiplication. So it has to be S times P plus C times Q, and checks whether this equals R. And if it does, um, the verifier believes that the prover knows alpha without the <coughs> alpha. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 <laughs> almost like wrong one. Um, right, so here we want to get rid of this group structure, so instead, um, we only take x coordinates. Let's, let's just stay in the genus one realm. So instead of having p and q, um, we only have access to their x coordinates. So x of p and x of q. Um, and the protocol doesn't change that much. So the first part, uh, the scalar multiplication, was first done in, a, in, the, in the full group. Um, but we still have a well defined scalar multiplication in, uh, in the Kummer line, uh, just using the more proper ladder, so using doublings and differential additions. Um, it's a second operation which is a little more tricky. So as a first idea, you can think, well, we have R, we can just project it to, uh, to, to its x-coordinates, and we can take the sum and project it to its x-coordinates. Um, but this doesn't work, of course, because the verifier doesn't have access to P and Q, so you cannot actually explicitly compute S times P plus C times Q. Um, so what you can do is you can compute either uh, the sum or the difference of S times P or C and C times Q. So instead, we can verify whether um, the x coordinate of r is the x coordinate of either the sum or the difference of these two things. Um, and for this, we need exactly this operation which I talked about before. So it's kind of this pseudo addition which gives you either the sum or the difference. Um, and this way, you can, uh, this way, we define the identification protocol, which is quite a small change to the original snore signature, um, and the proof, therefore, is also pretty analog. Um, so now we want the signature scheme, so we take this QID identification scheme, which is the Schnorr identification analog, we apply via Shamir and we get a, a signature scheme which we call QSIG. So this is kind of the Kummer analog of uh, Schnorr signatures. Um, and now we do some more changes which are similar to what NDSA does to Schnorr signatures. So for example, we include uh, public keys in some hashes against multi-target attacks and we make um, uh, the nonce generation deterministic. So we use a hash function instead of randomly generating this. Um, and this is where we end up in a scheme called QD. So I want to make some remarks about this. Um, so the first one, well, I, I said this earlier, the security proof is essentially the same. So you lose two bits of security, definitely. One for going down to the Kuma variety, so you lose a sign there. And then you lose another bit by only checking whether there's some word of difference. You're checking whether something's equal to some word of difference. Um, so you lose another bit there. Um, but you can see that uh, you don't really lose more, uh, at least in the, in the simplest proof. Um, so maybe the main benefit, or a benefit, is that the key pairs are now actually identical. Um, so in theory, you can take your curve to 5 of 19 uh, key pair, and you can sign a message with it. Um, in practice, you probably want to use different key pairs for different protocols for security reasons, but uh, there's nothing uh, theoretical blocking you there. Um, so keys are 32 bytes. Uh, signatures are 64 bytes. It's the same size as original Snore signatures. Um, in Genius 2, you have to work a bit for this. So their uh, public keys were originally 48 bytes, um, but we did some compression algorithm to bring this down to 32 bytes, um, which is not uh, expensive. Um, so maybe the main downside is that verification uh, slows down a little. Um, so originally, you have a two-dimensional scalar multiplication there, S times P plus C times Q. So you can apply all kinds of optimized algorithms, um, which are faster than doing two scalar multiplication separately. Um, but for our algorithm, um, this is not possible anymore. So you have to really do these two scalar multiplications separately, uh, which will probably slow you down. Um, yeah, so another remark I want to make, and this is kind of in response to responses we got on our paper. Um, so we are giving a kind of a theoretical protocol 
which shows that you can do these signatures using Coomers. Um, of course, we are not claiming that, so we did some reference code, some C code, which you can run uh, on many platforms. Um, but if you want to run this in a context where you care about side channels, so you want to run this on some embedded system, um, of course, you're going to want to add extra countermeasures to it as well. We're not claiming that just running the textbook uh, uh, protocol is going to make you secure against every possible attack out there. Um, uh, but luckily, all these uh, uh, countermeasures that apply to elliptic curves also apply to us uh, in most cases. Uh, okay, so I want to make some remark on how actually to compute these things. Um, so I will look at the Montgomery curves, which are kind of a good candidate for this. Um, and the main operation we that's kind of undefined is this taking two points and doing a pseudo addition, so getting the sum or the difference. Um, and since we can embed this into P1 on like a projected line, um, we can write, we can represent all these points with two field elements. So I'll label them x1, z1 up to x4, z4. Um, and now we have like kind of some operations which are very well known. Um, maybe they're they aren't always written in this way, but essentially we have two biquadratic forms, so B00 and B11, uh, and they're biquadratic in the coordinates of the input point. So they're quadratic in x1 and z1, and quadratic in x2 and z2. Um, and these define two relations between the sum and the difference, namely x3, x4 is equal to some biquadratic form, and z3 times z4 is also equal to some biquadratic form. Um, and you can easily see that if you know x3 and z3, you can kind of divide out by these, and you get some kind of x add operation, assuming that things don't vanish. Um, so the issue is that things do vanish, so sometimes things become zero. Um, and in that case, you need a third relation, um, which is kind of hidden, usually. Um, but you can use this relation to define some x double operations. So uh, then this gives you this, this ladder. Um, and if you rewrite this a little, you get some kind of matrix identity. Uh, so this is a projective identity, so up to some uh, simultaneous scalar, uh, these things are equal. Um, and now if you look at the first column, um, so the first row, uh, kind of the top left part says x3 times x4, um, and the, the second row of the first column says, well, projectively it says x3 uh, plus x4. So you, there's a relation between the, the product and the sum of the x coordinates of the sum and difference. Um, so what this defines uh, essentially is some quadratic equation, uh, for which the coefficients are exactly these biquadratic forms, which I defined earlier. Um, so now, if we want to find x3 and z3 and x4 and z4, we simply have to compute these three biquadratic forms, and we can uh, solve this uh, quadratic equation. And since it's a quadratic equation over some field, um, it will actually have exactly two solutions, and these solutions will be the sum and the difference. Um, so this would require computing a square root, um, but in our identification scheme, we don't have to explicitly compute these things. We are given a point, and we have to check whether it's the sum or the difference. Um, so all we have to do is evaluate it evaluate this quadratic equation um, at the point that we are given, and then it will tell us whether it's the sum or the difference, um, which is, uh, yeah. So this matrix identity here is its identity of two by two matrices, um, whereas this, uh, which leads uh, essentially to this one quadratic equation. Uh, if we move the genus two, um, this two by two matrix becomes a four by four matrix, um, and now every off diagonal by quadratic form, so this, this matrix is completely symmetric. Um, so we have 10 uh, by quadratic forms in a 4 by 4 matrix, then, uh, and every off diagonal, of which there are six, is going to define exactly one quadratic equation in this case. Um, so instead of having to check one, we have to check six. Uh, but uh, uh, if uh, all those six vanish, we still end up with either the sum or the difference in that case. Um, so computationally, this is actually uh, quite cheap. So in genus one, um, if you look at the cost for verification, you do two separate scalar multiplications. So one scalar multiplication or one ladder routine costs like two and a half thousand multiplications. So two of these is going to cost you five thousand multiplications. <laughs> so and then to compute these biquadratic forms and evaluate this quadratic costs you twelve multiplications. Yeah. So here uh, m means full multiplications, s means squaring, and c means multiplication by constant. Um, and in genus 2, um, your scalar multiplication requires like 8,000 multiplications. So you need 16,000 for the two of these, where you need about 180 uh, to do this verification routine. So it's, these costs are, are quite negligible in the, in the full scheme of things. Um, 
Right, do we still have time? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so we implemented this um, in C and uh, we ran this on some uh, small platforms. So one of them was the AVR at Mega. Um, that's the only one I'll talk about here. Um, so we instantiated this with curve to Puppet 19, kind of a popular curve out there. And you can see, if you compare this to an ETS to 519 implementation out there, which I've not mentioned at all, um, actually signing speeds up. Um, and you need much less uh, stack. Uh, but if you compare this to 4Q, which is a, a very recent implementation um, by Liu et al., um, their signing is much faster. This is because they use um, all kind of fixed based, uh, fixed based scalar multiplication routines, which allows them to speed this up a lot. Um, but this comes at the cost, uh, well, first of all, at the cost of a lot of stacks, so a lot of memory during the algorithm. Um, but moreover, and I didn't want to plot it in the graph because it's kind of hard to compare, um, but their um, implementations are much larger. So they use uh, their codes, uh, code bases are much larger because they have to implement many uh, different things. Um, so really what we're going for here is a very simple to implement small algorithm. Uh, yeah, if we compare it to verification, um, we are still much better than at 2519 and compared to 4Q. We are again um, uh, slower, so we, well, more than twice as slow, I guess, uh, but we use, uh, we use much less stack space, so much less memory. Uh, yeah, so finally, you can look at the Genius 2 case as well. Um, there's not much to compare to. We did an implementation last year uh, by kind of using the Jacobian by recovering to it and then moving back. Um, so there you see that the signing uh, uh, Speed-wise, it's quite similar, but again, memory-wise, we save a lot. Uh, and also, the, the implementation is again a bit smaller. Uh, and for verification, you see what you'd expect. So, verification a little bit slower, uh, but much more uh, memory efficient. Uh, all right, and I'll leave it there. So, thanks. Any questions? Um. So you described uh, the protocol, the ID protocol, as the Schnorr signature, but it's really ECDSA. I mean, Schnorr signature hashes this value, right, and checks the hash value rather than checking the quality points. So this is well, yeah, ECDSA. I think they're all kind of variants. I think the original Schnorr paper uh, doesn't do the hash, but also introduces a version which does the hash. Yeah, but with the hash, you can reduce the signature size. So you can make the signatures shorter by checking hash values instead of checking yes. the true values. But, so that wouldn't actually work in our case. Yeah, exactly. Don't do it. Right? Yes. So we, we get rid of this hash. Yeah, but yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thanks. Just forget.